Originally, you're from America, and now you've had a good stretch of time in this country. So, what do you sort of identify it as consumer differences? I've never tried to build a business in the U.S. Everyone is so price conscious. That's obviously there. So, I think that was always our kind of intention from day one: is to build an Indian brand. A lot of people from outside are actually coming to India to incorporate the business here because I believe the ecosystem is thriving. New initiative taken by our Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Gujarat as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an exciting time to be any brand in this space, especially in India, and that it's an exploding marketplace, right? You look at the GDP, you look at the spending power. As a foreign founder, like what has been your challenges yeah. in terms of building your business over here in India? Well, and just think, I can take advantage of this guy, right? Right. I noticed that your products are available in like you know Taj Hotels and Soho Mumbai. If you can get, just help us sort of build the path towards how do you get your products there? Over the last 10 years, India has been growing very rapidly. Because of the rapid growth, a lot of foreign entrepreneurs are moving to India to explore business opportunities here. Today, we are in conversation with Matthew, who is the co-founder of a clean label snacking brand, Natch, which he and his partner Meher has been building over the last seven years. In this conversation, you will learn about why did he choose India to be an ideal market for this retail FMCG brand, how did he get his products on the racks of exotic places like Taj and Soho in Mumbai? And what does he think about the Indian ecosystem to build a thriving business? So make sure you watch till the end so that you can take up a lot of notes and get your own business going very soon. Let's get started. Matthew, welcome to the India Man podcast show. Thank you. Yeah. Great to have you here. First, I would like to start with the most obvious question. Yeah. When did you come to India and you know, uh, how was the journey to actually come here and start something over here? Yeah. Um, so, uh, my wife is actually originally from Mumbai. So we had met in college and then both of us lived in New York for like 10 years. Um, and then, you know, around 2015, she had the idea like, let's go back for a year, see what it's like. You know, we were not married at the time, but you know, we were very serious and she said, let's go back for a year. And so 2016, we moved here for the one year plan. And that was, you know, eight years ago when we moved to India. We were just really struck that there was like a big um, lack of options in terms of like stuff that you'd see all around the world, stuff you saw in the US, but also in Europe and Asia and places like that. And the stuff that we were finding, it was a lot of um, fried package, you know, a lot of junk, you know, not very clean label, things like that. So we really felt like, okay, this is a big opportunity here. Interesting. So originally you're from America, yeah. right? Uh, and now you've had a good stretch of time in this country, right? So what do you think are like some of the things that you've, you know, sort of identified as consumer differences when it comes to an Indian consumer versus an American consumer? Mm -hmm. uh, if you can just help us paint that picture a little bit better. Yeah. Like what could be a, dif like what, how would you think differently when you're targeting a Western country versus India? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, of course, the first thing everyone always says in India is that, you know, everyone is so price conscious and, you know, that's obviously there, right? And I think most countries, I mean, America is such a consumer society. It's so ridiculous over there. I mean, like if you watch the American Shark Tank, yeah. someone has a frozen dog meatball yeah. and overnight they're doing $3 million of sales. Like you're not going to see that kind of consumer centricness in India. So, right. you know, in terms of the consumers, I think that price consciousness is there, but we have been able to sort of avoid it to some extent because we're a niche brand going after a premium marketplace, right? So to give you an example, we had our best selling product rice chips and we used to have a smaller pack for hundred rupees and it was in the modern trade, right? Like the, the very premium A plus category stores. Um, and then we said, you know what? We should do a bigger pouch, standing pouch. So we, we quadrupled the size and we tripled the price and we left it on the shelf and sales just tripled because those consumers didn't think of it, you know, looking at it like that. Now that's not a scalable business that's going to be capturing all of India. But again, where we're brand is positioned, we're able to kind of um, be a little bit less, like our consumers are not as price sensitive. Mm -hmm. But you know, I think also you find that you put something on sale and then you might get a big boon on your website. Mm -hmm. But then those people are not going to come back unless it's on sale. Again, they're going to wait for it. Right. So we kind of have to be a little careful about even putting things on sale at big discounts because then you're not going to get the repeat customer, right. right? So again, like I can't really speak to all of India. I'm not qualified for that, right? I can only say from our experience that, you know, the challenges are just in, um, I think, you know, really trying to build something that's memorable for people mm -hmm. that sticks out on the shelf. I think, uh, you know, in the early days, we met a lot of consumers that says it's too expensive. No one will buy <laughs> things like that. Right. But I think once people are able to try the products, then you get that strong reaction. So like if you notice, if you walk into a lot of shops, you know, a nature's basket or a reliance, there's a guy with a tray sampling our products. And then whenever that happens, sales will, really have a big, you know, uh, increase. Same with events. 
Because for us, the, the, the proof is in the taste. You know, people who try our products really connect with them, they really love them. And I think, um, you know, just like the US, I think India is a very visual culture. You see something on the shelf that looks nice, you know, if you taste something, something a little different. I think India is also changing a lot, even the eight years I've seen. But in general, you know, people are looking for these more worldly kind of things. People are looking for new flavors, new opportunities, you know, new things they haven't seen before, right? And I think this health trend is also there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's an exciting time to be any brand in this space, but you know, especially in India. Right. You mentioned that you're trying to sort of like focus on a niche and build a semi-premium brand, right? I noticed that your products are available in like, you know, Taj Hotels and Soho Mumbai, right? So if you can just help us sort of build the path towards how do you get your products there, mm -hmm. right? What would be the strategy? What, how did you get your products over there? That would be very insightful for our audience. All right, so before you learn about how can you take your products to the exotic places like Taj and Soho, let me also tell you that you can be in India and start selling to the Americans on Amazon.com in US. If you are interested in starting your own side hustle, passive income business or an e-commerce business wherein you are sitting in India and selling globally across the world and earning in dollars, you should absolutely check out the link in the description after you have seen this video. Now take a quick second and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss the next one. Let's get back to the video. So, you know, it, it, that's one of the big learnings that we've had over time is that initially, um, Meher and I just did it ourselves, right? Where we were starting this brand and that's kind of why the brand grew a little slowly in the beginning, especially because, you know, it's the kind of founder's burden where you try to do everything yourself, right? So we were literally, you know, pounding the pavement, going on LinkedIn, making the calls, going through a friend of a friend of a friend to find someone who could put us in touch with the person who would be the relevant point of contact for that, right? Um, so, you know, it's just a matter of like putting in the legwork and things like that. And now the learning that we have now, and you know, we have been able to raise um, a small round of funding, which of course helps with team building. And that's the major takeaway we have is that you need to bring in good people, right? Because what would take us six months to build out a list of clients, you could just hire someone who already knows these people, who has a relationship, who could start a business overnight for you, right? So these are the kind of things that in the initial days took a long time. And it's just the legwork, right? I mean, you just, for um, like, the Taj, you know, we went to one of their expos, we got invited to present. Same with Soho House, we just, we, we showed up there with our snacks and said, who handles this? Who can we speak to? You know, like that. Same with Nature's Basket, that was our first chain that we opened. You know, we just kept trying to go through a friend of a friend of a friend to find who would be the category manager for this. And from them, you hope to get a meeting. From them, you know, you just, you just gotta stay after it because they have a hundred brands beating at the door for the same thing. So you just try to have a unique offering and you be persistent and that's, you know, really it. Very interesting. So you have to keep at it and uh, sort of sometimes even get your own hands dirty rather than depending on some quick hacks or shortcuts. So both of you, right, you know, decided to sort of target the Indian market, yeah. right? An alternative route could have been that you guys are in India and that is a good convenience point, mm -hmm. but you could sort of cater to the world, yeah. right? In terms of making products that work in US or Canada or other places. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you have a chat uh, of that nature in the past? Like, you know, why would you target this country uh, rather than the Western markets? Not really ever. I mean, that's something we're looking at as the next step. But to be honest, like I remember um, when my wife Meher, her father would come visit us in the US right. and he would go to Trader Joe's and he would buy these chili mangoes that they had there. And he would take so much stuff back to India. Yeah. And then we just kept thinking, you know, like there's obviously some market for this here. Now the size of the market at that time was unknown, but there are people who want these Thai products or, you know, international kind of trends, like something like a pop chip or chickpea puff or like these things, like there's obviously some market for it there. Now, the extent and scope of it, we weren't fully aware, but there's obviously a premium category, right? That's available in India. And you know, now the data is showing that that's the fastest growing category. Snacks is blowing up. And then within that healthier snacks, you know, more, you know, label focused snacks are, are, are growing even quicker. So I think we were kind of not lucky, but you know, we just happened to be on trend, just sort of what we were interested in. And, um, you know, having said that now, I think that um, we were always looking to kind of bring Western snacks to India and not the other way around. Wonderful, wonderful. So as, as a foreign founder, what has been your challenges yeah. in terms of building your business over here in India? So, you know, I can only speak to my experience, right? And having said that, I've never tried to build a business in the US, so I don't have a basis for comparison. I don't know if it's any easier or more difficult. I'm sure there are some benefits that we get. I think in the one sense, maybe someone might be a little interested to take a meeting with us that they wouldn't. But the flip side is, 
we made an intention in the beginning of trying to keep me out of negotiations in the beginning. Because a certain partner might see me on the other side of the table and just think, I can take advantage of this guy, right? So I don't know if that's true or not. But there's definitely, you know, some pitfalls and some advantages. But again, I can only, I only know from what we've tried to do. And I just think that starting any business is hard. I think every founder is going to face challenges. I don't think being a foreigner is any harder or easier than anything else. Um, I think, you know, trying to understand the local FSSI regulations or, you know, even having a company, like my wife and I, we had to bring in another person to be a director because you can't have foreigners as the director. So, I mean, there's tax implications and things like that and, you know, some governance. But beyond that, I, don't, I haven't faced any sort of extra hardships as a foreigner, I don't think, you know. Um, but Incredible, yeah. So, I mean, as of now, like, you know, if you look at the last 12 months, right, mm -hmm. and where the country is going, mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, traction uh, on, on the side that a lot of people from outside are actually coming to India to incorporate the business here because I believe the ecosystem is thriving, mm -hmm. right? There's this new initiative taken by uh, our Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Gujarat as well. I think it's called Gift City or something, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, what is your opinion about that or what, what is your take on that? Like, is India sort of becoming like a better place to explore business opportunities for people who are outside as well, in general, across the world? I, I, I don't know about for outsiders, you know, I know that for me, um, it's been a great opportunity. But like, we're also here, we live here now, we're settled, you know. So, um, I don't know what the sort of benefits would be. I just know that, you know, you can see firsthand that it's an exploding marketplace, right? You look at the GDP, you look at the spending power. Um, I think that we saw something recently where it's like around 25% of people would be considered upper middle class, you know, as of last year. And then by 2030, it'll be more than 50%. And then it's not like you're talking about a country of 5 million people. When you have, you know, close to a billion people, over a billion people who are about to enter this kind of consumer segment, I mean, the, the power of that is going to be immense, right? So I think just in that sense, you're going to see a wave of outside capital, you're going to see a wave of you know, consumerism coming from inside the country and it's definitely an exciting time. It's definitely a lot of potential and a lot of opportunity. Very cool. So there's a lot of uh, upcoming uh, brands in the Indian ecosystem as well in mm -hmm. with regards to healthy snacks. Yeah. Right? A lot of them actually turn up on Shark Tank also. Yeah. Right. So currently, although you did state that, you know, you're not currently not targeting the entire country and there's a certain niche of audience. But in terms of uh, the product itself, how, how is Natch trying to position themselves differently mm -hmm. than the other alternatives available in the market. So I think to your point, like you do see so many of these healthy kind of brands coming up here, right? right? And while we do have a focus on health, that's definitely not what our main sort of selling point is. What we really position above all else is like taste and premium ingredients and quality, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have uh, one of our products, first of and foremost, you want to have that kind of wow taste factor where right. this is something amazing. I've never had this before. It's something unique. And then also you feel good about eating it or giving it to your kid or, you know, your husband or wife where it's, you know, it's all natural. You know, there's nothing artificial, right? So we're trying to balance this sort of great taste with wellness, right? So we don't claim to be a health food. We're not for people who, you know, are only going to the gym or, you know, are obsessed with losing weight or things like that. Of course, they could be part of that diet, but we're more into the people who want to have something that they really love and then kind of have that um, guilt-free factor, right? Where you just say, okay, at least I can look at the label and I say, I know what all these ingredients are. It's something simple. We say clean label, right? Because we don't have anything artificial, no chemicals, no kind of junk stuff in there that you say, what is monosorbate 5? You know what I mean? Something that's like, a, it's a complicated scientific term. We don't have that sort of stuff, right? So um, I think we really just are trying to position ourselves as this premium, you know, something that when your friends come over, this is like, Oh, you have to try this. Thing. You know what I mean? That kind of excitement, right? That kind of excellent taste and really quality ingredients. And, uh, you know, I think we're differentiate ourselves on that. You know, you look at something like we have a wasabi flavored rice chip. Yeah. So already no one's doing rice chips. And wasabi is now a flavor that's becoming more popular. But we've been doing it now for five, six years, like trying to find these kind of global trends and bring them here and package them in a really fun way where people will enjoy. Wonderful, wonderful. How has your experience been about team building? Right? Since you said, you know, you eventually figured that having a team is very critical. Yeah. And now you are trying to do more of that. Yeah. You know, so how has your experience been so far? So that is something, what is that? Uh, have you ever heard of this Malcolm Gladwell 1000 hours? Yeah. Or 10,000 hours rather? Yes. So I think I've had 10,000 hours of like LinkedIn interviews at this point. Wow. So I've gotten very good at uh, kind of reading between the lines. I think at first um, it was a big learning for me. Yeah. I think. Uh, number one, just communication style and, uh, you know, me coming from the U.S., 
it's just a sort of different um, process in terms of interviewing candidates and things like that. Um, but you know, what I do basically, I have a kind of a whole process I follow on LinkedIn, where uh, you know how we screen candidates and things like that. But um, I think now it's just like um, what we want more than anything is sort of those A team players, right? So someone's background is in terms of their work experience or their family. That's all very important. But really, it's that kind of that attitude, right? People who are hungry, people who want to prove it, people who want to join a team and, and kind of kick butt and really just like. Uh, have the final picture of what the market is, right? So it doesn't matter what the role is. Mm -hmm. Effort can overcome a lot, right? So I think we've gotten really good at identifying who are the people who are going to stand out, who are the people who you know, want to be part of a team, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of times we found people early on who were amazing at their job, but they wanted to do it in a silo. They wanted to do it by themselves, and that just doesn't work. All right, Matthew. So last segment, uh, we'll keep it quick and fun. This is rapid fire for you. So, first of all, like, what is your favorite Natch flavor that you snack on the most? Uh, it's got to be the sweet chili rice chips. Sweet chili rice yeah. chips. Amazing. And do you cook? Do you cook Indian food? Uh, no, I don't cook any food. No food at all? No. Right? I mean, okay. I can cook, you know. But do you like the Indian cuisine? Oh, yeah. Right. So, what's, what's your favorite uh, sort of like thing that you go out and have once in a while in India? So, um, my wife is Parsi. So, you know, my personal favorite is that kid Ghosh. That's um, very good. And, uh, you know, anything mutton right. is always good by me. Right, right. And if you had to describe Natch in three words, what would that be? Natural, delicious, unique. All right, so I hope you found this video insightful. Now, if you're interested in starting your own global e-commerce business, you can click on this video over here and start watching it right now, which will explain the entire process of getting your own branded products on Amazon in the US and start selling it to the American customers. I will see you in the next one.